Hello everyone. Sorry about the bouncing. These uh, beginning of the videos, I have it on this kind of arm, and as I press record, it tends to bounce up and down. But hopefully the videos are working out okay. I'm going to do a series of shorter videos, so kind of section by section this time, 9.1, 9.2, 9.3, and so on. Um, so getting into it, we're basically adding to our toolbox when it comes to solving quadratic equations. So we're now going to talk about how to solve quadratic equations using a different technique. This is the square root property. Um, what we've been doing up to this point is largely solving these quadratic equations by factoring. So that's what this first example is actually just a reminder of is uh, I actually just want to solve this with factoring. So just to remind us, we can totally solve this with factoring. So what I'd want to do is look for 1 times 14. So a times c is 14. And then I would look for factors of 14, if possible, that add up to negative 9 in this case. Um, if you kind of consider some of the options, I just focus on 14. 2 and 7 are really the only uh, interesting numbers that multiply to 14. So I would need a negative 2 and a negative 7, and this happens to work out, right? Negative 2 times negative 7, positive 14. Negative 2 plus negative 7, negative 9. So that means that this thing does factor. So what we were doing was we would then split up this middle term. So I can go x squared minus 2x minus 7x plus 14 equals 0. And then I can factor by grouping. So x can be factored out, leaving behind the x minus 2. Sorry, I have a runny nose today. Negative 7 can be factored out. X minus 2 equals 0. And factor out the commonality x minus 2. X minus 7 equals 0. So now this is the factored form of our original equation there. And now zero product property says that one or both of these factors should be zero. Right? If we multiply to a zero, zero has to be involved. So add two, add seven. So I'm getting that x equals two and x equals seven. And we can do a check just to make sure. So the claim would be that 2 squared minus 9 times 2 plus 14 is 0. And also, if you take 7 squared minus 9 times 7 plus 14, the claim is that we get 0. So 4 minus 18, negative 14, negative 14 plus 14 is 0. 49 minus 63 is negative 14. Negative 14 plus 14 is zero. So both of those do work. And yeah, this could have been a situation where I didn't have to go through these grouping stages, right? Because we have a one for A, so I could have just jumped right to here once I knew what the numbers were. Anyways, just a reminder about our, our uh, ability to solve these things by factoring, but not all polynomials factor is the problem, right? Like, what if instead of this problem, I had something very similar? What if it were x squared minus 9x plus 13 equals 0? Right, looking for numbers that multiply to a 13 and add to negative 9 in that case, right? This now doesn't work. So we want basically a method that works all the time. And what we're doing is we're kind of inching our way there. So a way of inching our way even closer is to talk about the square root property way of solving. So we are going to need, in certain cases, this 
imaginary unit. So keep in mind, whenever you have the square root of a negative, a factor of i will kind of come out of that. And then whenever you have i squared, that equals negative one. So we'll be using that imaginary unit definition within this section also. So on to page 103, let's talk about the square root property now. <laughs> so imagine we were looking for the solution to this equation. So we're looking for numbers that square to positive 16. So we want to find all numbers such that when we square that number, we get a 16. So definitely x equals 4. Right? If you have 4 squared, that equals 16. So 4 would be a solution to this equation. But there's another solution. If you take negative 4 and you square it, you also get positive 16. So both positive and negative 4 should be solutions to this equation. Let's see what the square root property would say about this. So what this is saying here, the <clears throat> square root property, is if u is an algebraic expression and d is a non-zero real number, then u squared equals d is equivalent to u equals root d or u equals negative root d. So that might be really confusing to think about. x squared equals 16. 16 is acting like d, just in reference to this, right? So 16 is acting like d. Uh, u is acting like x. So what this is saying is that we're going to get two solutions. Basically, I'll have that x equals the square root of 16 as one of my solutions and x equals negative the square root of 16 as my other solution. All right, so that's what this is saying, is you're going to get u equals the square root of 16, and u equals the negative square root of 16. In practice, what I would do notationally is I would apply the square root. So square root, square root, but when I do that, I have to use plus and minus. So I need that plus and minus there whenever I take a square root to solve. On the left, these two would cancel, and I now have x equals plus and minus 4. That's just another way of saying two answers in one. x equals 4, and x equals negative 4. That would all be for this one. So what we want to do, just kind of big picture, is we want to isolate the thing that's being squared. So that way I can apply a square root to it. And that way I get this cancellation to occur. So I'll say that again. We want to isolate the thing that's being squared so that I can apply a square root to it. So for example two here, part one, I have 4 times x squared equals 28. So x squared is not officially alone yet. Right? So what I want to do first is actually divide by 4 so that I can isolate the thing that's being squared. So now x squared would equal 7 in that case. Now once I'm here, <clears throat> I'm now looking at something that looks like this. As soon as you have that situation, apply a square root. You need to use plus and minus, or else you'll lose one of the true solutions. So on the left, the square root of something squared cancels, and I'm getting x equals plus and minus the square root of 7, which doesn't simplify. Right, The square root of 16 did, but square root of 7 does not. So you could leave it like this, or you could say x equals root 7 and x equals negative root 7. You can split them up that way. The plus and minus is just a way of saying two answers in one. It's both positive root 7 and negative root 7. It's not as though um, this number root 7 has like two 
identities or something. It's, it's not that it's both positive and negative simultaneously. It's that there's really two answers in one here. And of course we could check it. I'll do that over here. So the claim would be that four times uh, positive root seven squared equals 28. And the claim would also be that four times negative root seven squared is 28. And you can kind of get a sense for this, the square root of seven squared, this cancels. And the square also takes care of the negative. So in both cases, we're just left with a four times seven is 28. Four times seven is 28. So these both work. Part two, again, we want to isolate the thing that's being squared. So what I'll first do is subtract nine. So four X squared equals negative nine. And then I'll divide by four to isolate that thing that's being squared. So I have X squared equals negative nine fourths. Apply a square root. So square root of both sides. I need to use plus and minus whenever I use the square root. So now I'll have x equals plus and minus the square root of negative 9 fourths. And now I need to do some simplifying. So what I'll do is split up this negative. So I'll say x equals plus and minus the square root of negative one times nine fourths, right? That's the same as negative nine fourths. The product rule says I can split that across this product. So square root of negative one times the square root of nine fourths. The square root of negative one is I. So I have now X equals plus and minus I times quotient rule, I can say the square root of nine over the square root of four. Square root of nine is three. So I have X equals plus and minus I times three over two, right? Square root of four is two. So this would be our solution. Um, we usually write I's at the end if it's just a fraction or a whole number here. So probably most common to say x equals plus and minus three halves i. I'm going to check this one also. Um, I'll do that on a separate sheet of paper. <clears throat> So if that's our solution, then the original problem was 4x squared plus 9 equals 0. And our claim is that x equals plus and minus 3 halves i solves this. So let's go ahead and check that. So doing that check, we'll have 4 times, I'll go ahead and check the positive case. So three halves i squared, if I add nine, question mark, do I get zero? That's, this is our check. So I need to go ahead and square. So squaring means I square three halves and I also square i, right? Every member of this product gets squared. So I'll have four times nine fourths, right? I'm squaring three halves times I squared plus nine, are you equal to zero? The fours 
cancel. So now I have 9i squared plus 9 equals 0. i squared, if you remember, is negative 1. So 9 times negative 1 plus 9. This is negative 9 plus 9 is 0, which is true. So indeed, positive 3 halves i does solve this equation. Um, if you imagine just for a second that I did the negative case, then the square would take care of that negative just the same. And I would have positive 9 fourths right here. Everything happens the same after that. So that's why plus and minus both work. Okay. So moving on to page 104. Again, I'm going to leave some of these open, but of course I'll attach the uh, solutions next to this video. All right, so in this case, our algebraic expression u, remember that other page was saying if you have u squared equals d. So for this particular situation, u is not just x, but it's x minus 3. So I already have the thing that's being squared alone, which means I'm ready to take the square root. So for x minus 3 all squared equals 10, I'll apply the square root to both sides using plus and minus on the side with the pure number. Canceling, leaving behind x minus 3, just what was inside. And that now equals plus and minus root 10. And now we're solving for x, so just add 3. So I'm claiming that x equals 3 plus and minus root 10 are solutions to this equation. I'll just kind of lightly box that, but I'll do a check and then we'll come back and, and completely box it if it's true. So I'll use, again, the plus case. It doesn't matter. I'm just going to check one of them. So our claim would be that 3 plus root 10, right? This is x. Just like I had x, I now have 3 plus root 10. So I'm doing that positive case. And then minus 3, right? So all I have here is x. That's x. So I still need to subtract 3, this subtraction of 3 right there. Then I need to square. And the claim is that is this, or the question is, is this equal to 10? Right, 3 minus 3, those cancel away. So I now just have root 10 squared equals 10. And that definitely is true, 10 equals 10. If I did the minus case, I would just have a minus here and I would have a minus there. So when I square, still I would get positive 10 equals positive 10. I'll leave these next two open. I'll come back and do those later. All right, so just a couple more. So I'm leaving six open. I'll come back and do that later. Seven. So what I want to do is isolate the thing that's being squared. That's kind of the generally true thing about all these, is we want to isolate whatever's being squared and then apply a square root. So I'll subtract 4 first. So 5 times a minus 5 squared equals 100. Divide by 5, right? Not subtract, because this is 5 times. So divide by 5. I now have a minus 5 all squared equals 20. Um, now that I have the thing that's being squared completely isolated, I can apply a square root using plus and minus, of course, on the side with the number. These cancel. I get a minus 5 
equals plus and minus root 20. Now root 20, if I just think of it, root 20 is the same as the square root of 4 times 5, which is the same as the square root of 4 times the square root of 5 by the product rule, which is the same as 2 root 5 in simplified form. So this is the same as a minus 5 equals plus and minus 2 root 5 in simplified form. And just one more move, add the 5. So I have a equals 5 plus and minus 2 root 5. Please do check that. I'm not going to check this one. But if you plug let's say 5 plus 2 root 5 in for a, you should see that you get 104 on the left as well. Part 8. So this is one where if you try to get m squared alone, um, you'll never be able to get it alone without any other m's on the other side. What I mean is like, if you do isolate m squared, which we don't want to do actually in this, in this case, then what you'll have is something like 21 plus 12 m over nine. That would equal m squared, I believe. Let me just 21 plus, yeah. I believe this would be what you have for m squared. But I have m's over here, I would also have m over here. And I'm not allowed to solve for m in terms of m. Like I can't say, if you're asking me, what is x? I can't tell you, oh, it's x plus 7. Because it's, <laughs> you would still be wondering, okay, what is x? Right? If, if you, uh, if you didn't know what the word tall meant. I'm not allowed to use the word tall in the definition for tall. So if I'm defining the word tall, I'm not allowed to say it's when someone is tall. <laughs> right? So that would be basically what's happening here is like I'm defining M with respect to M. So if I have two unknowns on either side, really, I don't, I still don't know the unknown, right? If I have an unknown, that's equal to a pure number. Now I know the unknown is this pure number. So a long way of saying what we don't want to do in this case is actually isolate m squared. We want to write this whole thing, if possible, as something squared. <clears throat> so if I factor this, 9 times 4, a times c, 36, then factor 36, trying to add up to a negative 12. So let's see. Um, 9 times 4 would be 36. Uh, what else? 9 times 4 is 36, obviously. So 9 and 4 don't do it. Um, what about 3 and 12? That doesn't really do it either. 6 and 6. Negative 6, negative 6. Right? So negative 6 times negative 6, positive 36. Negative 6 plus negative 6, negative 12. This is looking good. So I'll go ahead and say 9m squared minus 6m minus 6m. That's now what is replacing negative 12m. Then I have plus 4, and this all still equals 25. So factor by grouping. So I have a 3m that are shared here, so 3m, 3m minus 2 left behind. Factor out a negative 2, it looks like, leaving behind a 3m minus 2, and this all still equals 25. 
factor the commonality. So 3m minus 2 is shared. And then I have another 3m minus 2 that's left behind, luckily. So 3m minus 2 times 3m minus 2 is 3m minus 2 all squared. And this equals 25. Now we want to take that square root. Plus and minus. So I'll have 3m. It's too many. It's like an m and a half. 3m minus 2. This equals the square root of 25 is 5. So I'll have plus and minus 5 over here. Add 2. I'm solving for m. All right, so 3 m equals 2 plus and minus 5. You could also write plus and minus 5 plus 2 and then divide by 3. So we're claiming that m equals 2 plus or minus 5 over 3. You can leave it like that if you want or you can actually find these two numbers. So one of the numbers is from taking uh, 2 and adding 5 and then dividing by 3. So you can write m equals 2 plus 5 is 7 over 3 is 7 thirds. And then take 2 minus 5, that's negative 3, negative 3 over 3, negative 1. And I encourage you to check those. You should see if you plug in 7 thirds and negative 1 that you get 25 on the left as well. All right. Talk to you next time. See ya.